Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's really a privilege to be able to share the gospel with you guys. As Dave said, I was born in Argentina. I moved to Spain with my family uh, as a missionary. Uh, I lived in Spain for 22 years. I met my wife in Malaga 20 years ago. Uh, I met Betel through her. So four years ago, we decided to, to come to the Betel community in Birmingham and be part of that beautiful community. So yeah, thank you for, for having us. I would like to start asking, what do you think? What are the, pre the, the greatest pleasures in life? What, what would you say? Some people may say, Pleasure is in Las Vegas, in Beverly Hill, Hawaii. I searched in the internet and this came up. This list came up. Pleasure is found in holding a sleeping baby, kissing someone for the first time, having a lovely meal, watching a movie, drinking water, have fun times with good friends. Now, I would like to show you the list of the greatest pleasures in life according to God. Number one, King David says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. The lines that mark the boundaries of my property are pleasures. Number two in the list, blessed, blessed is the one whose delight is in the Lord of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Delight and pleasure is in the law. Number three, if you obey and serve him, you shall spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasures. Obey and serve God is a pleasure. Finally, King David says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What are the greatest sources of pleasures according to God? According to God, pleasure is found in serving, in obeying, in His presence, and in our spiritual inheritance. Would you agree with that? Would you pick the first list I found on the internet, or would you pick this one? Let me give you an example. We love babies, right? It is a pleasure to hold them, cuddle them, play with them. But when the time to change nappies come, time to wake up at night and feed them, that is not pleasant, isn't it? <laughs> Nappy changing is the mom's job, and the joy and pleasure... <laughs> Well, that is job as well. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. English is it's not my first language. That's a... <laughs> okay, I will start over. It's okay. Nappy changing is the dad's job. <laughs> And the, joy, and the joy and pleasure of being a dad comes with some uncomfortable responsibilities. It is a pleasure, for instance, going to a Brazilian buffet and have all the meat you can eat. But after eating way more than you should have, you may feel so sick that all you want to do is throw up, right? And that is not pleasurable anymore. So we could say that the pleasure of eating, of having all you can eat, comes with a, with a responsibility. I'm going to eat just enough because be, before it becomes unhealthy. You know, God created the Garden of Eden to be a sphere where, where he may walk and connect with us. Do you know what Eden means? It means place of pleasure, place of delight. God created Eden to be a place of pleasure. 
If you remember, Adam and Eve disobeyed when they ate the fruit of the tree. And it is interesting that the Garden of Eden was not a place of pleasure because the fruit of the tree was pleasing to the eye. On the contrary, it was when they fixed their eyes on the pleasing fruit that the tree, that the garden lost its enjoyment. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit that was pleasing to the eye, they exchanged the real pleasure of enjoying the company and the presence of God for something that just seemed to be pleasing to the eye. The Garden of Eden was a place for eternal life. It was a place for eternal pleasure, enjoyment, and delight. However, since greediness is in human nature and no pleasure has ever been enough, they wanted to try something new. So they exchanged real pleasure of enjoyment, of enjoying his presence for something that just seemed to be pleasing. We are humans. We love enjoyment. We love happiness. Uh, we love satisfaction. Do you remember the first list of the greatest pleasures I read earlier, that, the one I found on the Internet? Well, there was a guy in the Bible, a very wealthy guy, who had the opportunity to taste all the pleasures he could in his lifetime. But listen what he said after having tried almost everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. This is King Solomon. This is him telling us his experience. And he writes, I, say to my, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. I tried cheering myself up with wine and embracing folly. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I became greater by far than anyone before me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Yet, when I saw all that I had surveyed, all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom, and also madness and folly. I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. That's it. Just as light is better than darkness. Many of us have experienced darkness like he did, but not many have seen the light he has. He had seen the light, so he tried and could tell us that pleasure is meaningless compared to obeying and fearing God. Just as he saw from a higher perspective, so, so we need to aim that same level of revelation. King David declared about God's presence in the book of Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Think about it. According to your own experience and your own understanding of what pleasure is, could you relate God to pleasures? Think about it for a minute and be honest to yourself with yourself. I do, I do believe the answer sometimes is likely to be a no. I do not find any kind of pleasure in anything related to God, which is perfectly understandable. Of course, there is no pleasure in obeying according to our own understanding of pleasure and obeying. However, if we find no pleasure in God, there might be something external to the divine and spiritual interfering between eternal pleasure and us. It is quite possible we are letting those little pleasing to the eye fruit hinder us 
from the presence of God that gives us the true pleasure in a spiritual life. It is quite possible we are letting all those little pleasing to the eye fruits hinder us from the presence of God, which gives us the true pleasure in our spiritual lives. King David discovered he found real pleasure in God's presence. Job found pleasure in obeying God. And the psalmist found pleasure, delight in the Lord of God. So I would say, if that is not happening to us, because it's in the Bible, it is in the Bible, they experienced that. If that is not happening to us, there might be something we are missing. There must be some sort of unrevealed pleasure that is being hidden from us. There must be some sort of unrevealed pleasure that is being hidden from us. Psalm 16, verse 6 says, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. The spiritual land, the spiritual atmosphere we live in as sons and daughters of God in the kingdom of heaven here on earth, it is a pleasant and delightful inheritance. We need to learn how to be able to see the spiritual realm we live in and not just the physical realm. You know, there is something powerful here that needs to be re revealed in our spirit. We need to understand that in the spirit. It's not, it's not just about teaching theology to feed our knowledge only. The word of God is a spiritual and it needs to penetrate deep in our spirit. Your spiritual inheritance is pleasant and delightful, both your future inheritance in eternity and here on earth now in the spiritual realm through the Holy Spirit. We can see the Garden of Eden as God's original design, right? That was the place of pleasure. And it was created to be eternal. Did you know that? It was created to be eternal. It was physical, and it will probably be physical again someday. But although we lost the physical Garden of Eden thousands of years ago, we can now, through the kingdom of heaven on earth, experience the the spiritual garden of Eden, which is our delightful inheritance in Jesus. We can get access to that real pleasure when we comprehend the sphere of the eternal and we enter into it. Not just looking yourself at yourself in body, in body, but, just, but also understanding our eternal inner being. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 2, verse 6. God raised, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in, in Christ Jesus. We need to learn that although our bodies and emotions walk on earth, our spirit, our spirit is somehow seated in heavenly and eternal places. Of course, pointing to the identity and authority we acquired and we will acquire in Christ. That is who we are. That is our destiny. And that is the dimension we need to learn how to walk in. We are not just this. We are not just this or this. We are destined to be seated in heavenly places. When we grasp that, we begin to operate differently because we operate from our spiritual identity. Ba back to babies. You know, holding a baby for, for a few minutes and then leaving is a temporary pleasure. But the pleasure of being uh, the baby's mom or dad 
comes with the responsibility of parenting. You will never understand the pleasure of being a mother or, or, or a father, the love of, of a mother. You will never experience the love of a mother until you are an actual mother or, or a father. When you become a mother, when you get that position and identity, uh, you just take your responsibility as a mother and do, you, and do what you have to do instinctively. How? You do it out of, lo out of love. You know who you are, so you know what to do. No one has to tell you what to do. You don't need to go through a study on how to love your child. That becomes natural in you because you have accepted your place. You have accepted your identity and responsibility as a father or mother. It is the same in Christ. We need to understand identity, who we are in Christ we live by revelation of, of spiritual principles, not by commandments. That is the moment when you start finding pleasures in who you are, in the Bible, in the presence of God, in the Lord of God, when you understand who you are. God says, I will put my laws into your mind. I will write them on your heart. That is powerful, isn't it? Another example. Most of us have experienced the pleasure of eating chocolate, right? But not many have the experience of feeling healthy, strong, or fit. Why? Because the pleasure of being healthy and strong comes from food discipline and working out. There are temporary and easy-to-get pleasures like eating chocolate, but also permanent pleasures which is found, which come with discipline and hard work. You can enjoy the easy to get pleasure by spending a night with someone you don't know, but real pleasure is found in really loving someone. You will never experience the real pleasure of loving until you get to love and you get loved by someone. And that real pleasure comes with true love. It comes with making a commitment with promises of loving unconditionally and being faithful to the end. What am I trying to say? There are levels of pleasure that we have not reached yet because we are not willing to pay the price. Focusing our attention on easy to get pleasures nullifies the capacity for enjoying real pleasures Hebrews 12, verse 2, says, Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross with so much joy, knowing that there was a chance to save us. He found a chance to save us. He suffered the cross with joy, knowing that the pleasure of getting us saved will be greater than such suffering. Isn't that great? Now, try to remember those moments when you, ha when you have experienced your highest levels of pleasure. I'll give you a few seconds. Those moments when you have experienced your highest levels of pleasure, were they right, lawful pleasures or not? Generally not. Oftentimes your highest moment of pleasure may be short-lived and they usually lead into frustration and depression because you know that someone you love could be emotionally hurt. We think we can give free reign to pleasures, but paradoxically, temporary pleasures take away the pleasure of freedom. Temporary pleasures take away the pleasure of freedom. The price to pay for temporary pleasures is peace, is freedom, is joy, 
and eternal and real pleasures. Is it worth paying? You know, I walk on the cross trainer for half an hour almost every day. My goal is to gain resilience. By the time I've walked 20, 25 minutes, I'm done, I just wanna quit, but I carry on as my goal is to gain resilience. So minute 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, and 20, minute 30, on the minute 30, it releases the tension into cooling down. You hold on until it releases the, the, the tension. That is such a pleasure. It is such a pleasure, pleasure to have made it. You will never experience such a pleasure until you decide to hold on, until you have a greater goal that makes you suffer and pay the price. We need to find that revelation of who we are that will make us suffer and pay the price. Worship team, if you want to come up, please. The book of Job, 36, verse 11. Job said, if you obey and serve him, you shall spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasures. Pleasure in obeying. Who wants to get to that level? That revelation will take us into a higher level of maturity in Christ. Let me tell you a story to close. At the age of 14, some of my friends, some, some friends of mine and I decided we were going to pay some woman to spend a few minutes of pleasure with them. That would be new to me. I was a, a boy, 14 year old. But right before I got through the door with my friends, I felt the fear of the Lord and the Holy Spirit saying to me, you don't have to do it. You are my son and you don't have to do it. Don't do it. And I didn't. I stood outside just waiting for my friends to come out and go back home. And I can tell you at that minute, I decided to obey God. That was the happiest moment of my life. I can honestly tell you that I know, I do know the pleasure of obeying God. I have experienced many kinds of different pleasures but no one compares to the pleasure of obeying God. If you think of it naturally, you would say, that's nonsense. But it is not until you leave it out and it's revealed to you that you, can get, that you get to understand it and taste it. Please stand. We're going to pray to finish.